Because I could not stop For death He kindly stopped for me The carriage held But just ourselves And immortality And immortality This is Michael Moore This is my podcast. The song was Natalie Merchant, along with Susan McEwen and the Chanting House singing, singing their riff on the Emily Dickinson poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, He Kindly Stopped for Me. It's sort of a mournful, soulful tune to play today appropriate for what we're going to do on this episode of my podcast. For now, over three weeks, I, like many of you, have felt deep despair. I felt it actually for much longer than these three weeks. I first visited Gaza almost 30, 39 years ago. That's how long this little strip of land, three to five miles wide, about 25 miles long. One of the most god-awful sights imaginable. And when I first saw it, I never recovered from it. 39 years ago, this has been with me. And I went back to Gaza. (sighs) I wasn't prepared for what I saw. And it's been like this now for, for me at least, for what, almost four decades of being a witness. And lucky me. (laughs) All I have to do is suffer through what I observe and see and experience, but I don't have to be Palestinian. And to wake up all these years later in the morning of October 7th and to learn that there are over 1,400 dead, slaughtered Jewish brothers and sisters in the streets, in their homes. I want to live in a world where we don't slaughter anybody where we don't harm or take hostages or put anybody in an outdoor prison for 17 years. I don't want to live in that kind of world. (laughs) But I'm alive. I'm alive and I'm a witness and I'm a citizen of of this world. And I just can't turn away. I can't ignore what's going on. And you've heard me, those of you who've been fans of mine for a long time, say that that I will not stand for anti-Semitism. I will not stand for any kind of bigotry or racism. I will not stand for anybody who wants to harm the Jews of this world. And I've talked in the past about what I've done throughout my life since I was a teenager to stand up against the haters to stand up and say with other non-Jews, with Gentiles, that we will never let what happened in the 20th century ever happen again, never again, never again. But that promise, that pledge, if you're Jewish and you hear a non-Jew like me say, I will never let this happen to you again, I will stand, I will have your back, I will not allow harm, to you, if you don't also hear me say that I also will not let that happen to any Palestinian brother or sister of mine on this planet, if I can't say that also, then I have no credibility when you hear me say that I will stand for you. You shouldn't believe me, in fact. If I can't also say that I will not let harm come to the Palestinian people, that I will stop this madness, I will stop this treatment, I will stop this apartheid, I will stop this, I will do whatever I can. I will not let my government 
send weapons, send billions of dollars to fund a sad, disgusting, disastrous situation. And I've had many talks with many Jewish friends, family members. My niece had her bat mitzvah at Masada, you know, the cliff there in Israel, the Holy Land, where Jews were forced to jump many, 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 many hundreds of years ago because they would not take being slaves, be it subservient to the masters of that time and lost their lives as a result of it. This is where she, she, she didn't have her bat mitzvah at the, at the wall, the Western Wall. She had it at Masada. <laughs> So, you know, I don't know I'm going to take the time today to talk to you about all this because I'm, I have a lot to say and I will, I will say it here in the next days and weeks to come. It's taken me this long just to wrap my head around it, just to get over some of the grief so I could think clearly and say the things I want to say in the coming weeks here. And when I say weeks, we don't really have any time because, because they're, they're being slaughtered, children are being killed. There's a carpet bombing going on. There's no such thing as they're targeting Hamas. <laughs> I mean, I know you, I don't have to tell any of you this. You're smart enough to know the BS. But especially for these last few nights, you know, now some cameras have gotten in there. They wouldn't let any in at the beginning because they shut down, canceled. They got rid of all the uh, communication towers and Internet, so we didn't see anything these past few days, but now we're seeing the images of neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood, miles upon miles, leveled, just buildings leveled, rubble, nothing but rubble. God knows how many people are under that rubble. And you could never say to me, you could never justify that to me, oh, well, so-and-so who lived in that neighborhood did this awful thing, and so we're going to go kill a bunch of their people. We won't last as a world, as a planet, as humanity, if that's how we, that's how we think. And vengeance, vengeance will be the death of all of us. After 9-11, nobody could think straight in this country. And so right away it was like, let's invade, let's invade, let's invade Afghanistan, let's invade Iraq. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, didn't matter. Let's go kill what did we kill? Three hundred, about three. The estimate is about three hundred thousand Iraqi civilians. That's who we are. But you know, listen, we're the pros at genocide. So this goes back a long way. Uh, North Americans and the people that first settled here, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the the British. We we're really good at genocide, and we've been copied by the masters. There's this. I'm sure you've read or heard, you know, this in, just incredible, awful story of how Hitler, when he was elected in 1932, 33, sent um, a couple of academics to the U.S. to study how the U.S. gets away with putting their people of color in the parts of town, the ghettos. How do they create the ghettos and how do they, how do they make sure that they have no power? They actually studied this. In the night the Germans did in, 19, in the 1930s. <laughs> well, I have a lot more to say about all this, but I thought on this first episode of us talking about this this uh, horrific slaughter going on, uh, that I would I would let the people of Israel, our Jewish neighbors, our brothers and sisters, and our Muslim and Palestinian. Uh, brothers and sisters, um, have the microphone here. So I'm part one in today's podcast. My team here, my Rumble, my podcast team went down to a mass demonstration at uh, rush hour on Friday afternoon where um, a few thousand New York City Jewish men, women, children took over Grand Central Station 
and shut it down in a mass act of civil disobedience. We joined them uh, so we could give the microphone to them so we could hear what they had to say. That's what you're going to hear on today's episode of my podcast. It'll be a series of people to talk about why they belong to the Jewish Voice for Peace, JVP. And I personally joined Jewish Voice uh, for Peace myself. Um, these are people demanding an end to the Israeli slaughter, uh, an end to, um, they're asking for a ceasefire, both sides, ceasefire, uh, a release of the hostages, stop the killing. And as Jews, they wore these t-shirts that said, not in my name. They, over and over, they told us on Friday night, I don't want a single Palestinian hurt in my name. As a Jew, I will not stand for this. Over and over, this is what we heard. It's very powerful. And um, police at first didn't quite know what to do or how to take care of this because it was, uh, they had shut down Grand Central Station, which is, you know, no, no easy feat here. So I'm going to turn it over to them you, you'll hear some of the chanting and some of the singing also that was going on and because this is an audio podcast i don't have subtitles to put up there for you so you can you know hear them but um uh, i'll just i'll tell you some of the the chants i think you'll be able to understand most of them they're chanting not in our name raising our voices higher and higher no war no war call for a ceasefire ceasefire now your people are my people. Your people are mine. These are Jews chanting this to the Palestinians of this world, and especially in Gaza. Where you go, I will go, Palestine. Where you go, I will go. Never again for anyone. Never again is now. So you'll hear all this, and then you'll hear some of the little brief interviews we did. I really want to thank the only two executive producers that this podcast has had, and it's what will be almost, uh, it'll be four years old here, this podcast, uh, in uh, in December. The co-founder of this with me was uh, Basil Hamden, and was he was the executive producer of it uh, for the first uh, um, two and a half years. And then for the last year and a half, uh, Angie Vargos has been uh, the uh, executive producer. Uh, Basil is a Palestinian American, and uh, Angie is originally from Illinois. <laughs> so um, I'm not, it's not a false equivalency or anything. I'm just just letting you know who they are. Two great people I've been able to work with, and uh, a real privilege and an honor. So my thanks to them for, and you'll hear their voices doing a little bit of this interviewing and talking to people there in Grand Central, uh, Basil and Angie. So. And then part two of this in a few days will air because the very next day on Saturday of this weekend, uh, we went to Brooklyn and again, Angie and Basil marched with the Palestinian demonstration for peace and talked to Palestinians and Palestinian allies, which was one of the amazing things of this massive uh, march and demonstration on Saturday is how many people came out to support Palestinians, all kinds of people, all uh, ethnicities, uh, races, religions, colors, old and young, it's very powerful. So I'll play that for you in a couple of days on part two of this. I think before we get going, I, gotta, I wanna thank a couple of my underwriters here, and then a couple more I'll thank at the end of the, of the podcast. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Our human brains are extraordinary organs, and they are also extraordinarily complex, and sometimes it can be hard to sort through all the thoughts that go through our heads every day. It's easy to get lost, and sometimes we end up getting in our own way. That's where therapy comes in. Talking to a therapist can help you figure out how to work for yourself instead of against yourself. If you're thinking of starting therapy, check out BetterHelp because it's entirely online, it's convenient, and it's completely flexible to your schedule. They'll have you fill out a, a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And if it's not a great fit, that's okay. You can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash Rumble today and get a 10% off discount for your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Rumble. For all of you omnivore rumble listeners out there, if you're anything like me, you're going grocery shopping, you want to know exactly where the food's coming from, especially the meat that you're buying. But as you also know, depending on where you're doing your shopping, that information is not always accessible. That's what I love about Moink. I never have to question where the meat is sourced because every delivery is coming straight to my door from a small American family farm. You get to choose the meat that is delivered in every box, from grass-fed beef and lamb to pastured pork and chicken and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon. And the best part, my favorite part, is that you're helping family farms stay financially independent from big agriculture. So, if you haven't tried Moink, give it a shot. The meat is delicious and you can cancel anytime. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash rumble. Do it right now, and listeners of this podcast get free ground beef for a year. That's one year of the best ground beef you'll ever taste, but this is for a limited time. So it's spelled moink, M-O-I-N-K, moink, moinkbox.com slash rumble. That's moinkbox.com slash rumble. Okay, so we're back now, and now let's turn the microphone over to uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, live from, (laughs) semi-live from Grand Central Station on Friday night at rush hour. One of the most powerful demonstrations I've ever seen in New York City. So many people and so many Jewish voices demanding an end to all of this. It's, It's very powerful. and I'm a Holocaust survivor and I'm totally against what Israel does. My name is Dr. Steve Auerbach. I am Jewish, I am a pediatrician and I'm calling for ceasefire now, not in my name. The horrific attacks by Hamas were indeed horrific, but history did not begin on October 7th. Mass retaliation by Israel against civilians is itself also a war crime. And as a pediatrician, I am saddened and despondent at the deaths of children and their families uh, in Gaza, in Palestine, in Israel. I've never been prouder of my completely mainstream New York State chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics which came out with a statement on October 13th calling for a ceasefire on behalf of the children of Israel and Gaza and Palestine. I I am shocked, disappointed, I don't know what the right word is, that calling for a ceasefire while thousands of civilians are being killed is somehow considered an extremist position. Calling for a ceasefire in the midst of mass bombings of civilian areas is and should be a normative mainstream view. I call on President Biden. I call on Senator Schumer, majority leader in the Senate. I call on my own congressperson, Nadler, who considers himself the senior Jewish representative in the House. I call on them to stand up for actual Jewish values a ceasefire, no more killing of children, and moving towards an honest negotiated settlement. The right-wing government in Israel has had no interest in a two-state solution. That's why they've spent the last 10 years propping up Hamas. 
neither of those two parties has in any interest in a two-state solution, and we just get these endless cycles of violence. The United States can use its um, authority and power where it has leverage, principally with Israel, to insist, insist on a ceasefire now and real movement to a just, internationally recognized uh, two-state solution borders. And on behalf of the children and families uh, of Israel and of Palestine, I, I send you my love, I send you my care as a pediatrician, as a Jew, as a father. You mentioned it shouldn't be controversial to want a ceasefire, right. but are you heartened to see that the first polls that have come out show that the majority of Americans actually do want a ceasefire, and the majority of Americans don't want the United States sending more weapons to Israel. Does that hearten you at all? It heartens me uh, to the extent that we can believe the polls. It heartens me that people are seeing what's going on with their own two eyes um, on the screens. And please take care of yourselves. Watching these videos over and over again is also harmful. I was a first responder with 9-11 and watching horrific videos over and over again is, is, is not good for your own health. But having seen that, Please stand for a ceasefire. The brave uh, 18 or so Congress persons who supported the ceasefire now, uh, including Jamal Bowman, who I worked for, including Velasquez, including AOC in the New York City area, bravo to them. But again, yeah, I, you know, Israel bombed the heck out of Gaza roughly 10 years ago, then spent the next 10 years propping up Hamas because neither party's interested in an actual solution. And here we are bombing again. So clearly bombing is not the solution. Clearly more civilian deaths is not the solution. And again, as a pediatrician, all I can do really is hold up the value as a Jew that all lives matter, as a Jew and a pediatrician that all children's lives matter and their families. And that, you know, these mass bombings, semi-discriminate, I guess at best you could call them, is simply unacceptable, and that's why we call for a ceasefire now. So are you here to take a train? Excuse me? Are you here to take a train today? I am, yes. I'd like to say that I believe that this is a volatile situation, and I don't think anybody here wants to add to the bloodshed or the, or, or, or the sorrow that is on both sides that is fueling the anger. And um, I believe that this is a dangerous situation and uh, it's, not, it's not the way to address it. I would like to say that to the crowd if it were possible. I'm here because I just feel like I can't sit by and watch ethnic cleansing and genocide happening in my name. I just can't watch it. Are you Jewish? I am, yeah. And you're willing to be arrested for that today? I'm willing to be arrested for that as much as it takes. I just, we can't allow this to happen and have the world sit silently and just watch it as if Palestinian lives don't matter. They do matter. I'm married to a Palestinian and my family is Palestinian and I am here so my children can live in freedom and dignity and all Palestinians can live in freedom and dignity in their homeland. And today you're willing to be arrested for that cause. Hell yeah!
Jay Saper, and I'm here with Jewish Voice for Peace. Thousands of Jewish New Yorkers reverberated our voices here in Grand Central Station in New York City, calling for a ceasefire. Right now, hundreds of arrests are being made. As a people who have survived a genocide, we know that we have to do everything we can to put our bodies on the line to try to stop a genocide from unfolding in real time against the Palestinians of Gaza. Have you been heartened to see, despite some very tough media coverage, that in the first round of polling, the majority of Americans actually do want a ceasefire? I mean, at first it felt like we're on the defensive, everyone is against us, everyone who wants peace, that the media is rushing to war again, but it seems like there's actually a groundswell of support in favor of a ceasefire. Is that what you're sensing? Are you seeing that? Are you feeling that? Yeah, well, this evening you got to feel the resounding collective dissent of us raising our voices saying we need a ceasefire. We were just in Washington, D.C. last Wednesday where hundreds got arrested in Congress calling for a ceasefire as well. We know that the public wants a ceasefire, does not want the U.S. to send more money and more weapons to Israel, but instead call for an immediate ceasefire. Some of your Jewish brethren, it's the term that gets used all the time, will say, self-hating Jew. Look at what these animals did to us on October 7th. You're taking their side. How could you do that? What do you say when you hear something like that? We understand that everybody is grieving in this moment. And we refuse to allow our own pain and trauma to be used to justify further acts of violence against another people. We are raising our voices to say, not in our name. The hundreds who are getting arrested are wearing t-shirts right now that say, not in our name, because we believe that our safety can never come at the expense of the safety of another community. We are proudly Jews who believe that our tradition compels us to take action for justice, to honor life as sacred. And so we had rabbis here getting arrested with us who are deeply rooted proudly in our Jewish tradition, which tells us to take action to save life, to speak up right now, to try to stop the bombing of Gaza, and also to challenge the U.S. government, which sends $3.8 billion every year in military funding to Israel. We know that that U.S. complicity and moral cover has allowed Israel to carry out not only this latest act of violence, but 75 years of occupation and apartheid, which are the root of the violence that we have to address. For people who are listening that want to do something, say something, take part in this, where should they go and what can they do? So right now, everyone is needed to raise your voice to call for a ceasefire. You can call your members of Congress and demand that they support the ceasefire now resolution. You can take to the streets to support demonstrations that are right now helping to build the international outcry that is necessary to bring an end to Israel's bombing of the 2.2 million Palestinians trapped inside the world's largest open-air prison in Gaza. If they want to take collective action with Jewish Voice for Peace, which organized this historic demonstration here this evening, you can go to jvp.org slash act. Powerful, powerful words um, on Friday night at Grand Central Station. Um, 
Uh, before I close out here, let me just uh, thank our other two underwriters for this episode. And uh, much gratitude toward those who support this podcast, who financially support it uh, uh, and support my voice. It's not necessarily always the popular thing to do, but um, there's enough good people that want to do the right thing and want to live in a world of peace. And I appreciate them sponsoring this podcast. So next up, uh, a huge thank you from us to Shopify. They're a longtime underwriter of Rumble. And if you're thinking of starting your own shop, or maybe you've got one already, but you're always looking for a way to grow it, Shopify makes a great partner. They help you sell at every stage of your business, from launching your online shop to cutting the ribbon at your first uh, real life store, all the way to fulfilling your millionth order. Shopify is there to help you grow. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Plus, and this is my favorite part, Shopify gives you access to extensive help resources to support your success every step of the way. That's why 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. and millions of other business owners across 175 countries around the world use Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash rumble and make sure you put rumble all in lowercase, R-U-M-B-L-E. So it's shopify.com slash all lowercase now, rumble. Go to shopify.com slash rumble now and you can grow your own business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash rumble. Okay, so our final underwriter for today's episode of my podcast begins with me asking you a question. What do you call a person who speaks three languages? Trilingual, right? Yeah, trilingual. And someone who speaks two? Bilingual. And someone who speaks one language? We call that American. That's right, because only 22% of Americans can speak a language other than English at home. So start learning a new language right now, this fall, and be the exception, not the rule, and do it with Babbel. Why Babbel? Because it works. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. So if you start now, by Thanksgiving, you can say, pass the yams in French or Spanish or whatever. The lessons are designed by real people for real conversations. So all of Babbel's tips and tools for learning a new language are approachable, accessible, and rooted in real life situations and delivered with conversation-based teaching. Studies from Yale, Michigan State, and others continue to prove that Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. So I've got a special for you, a special deal for our listeners to get you started right now. Get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but it's only for our listeners at babbel.com slash rumble. We're really happy to welcome our new underwriter here, Babbel, and you can get 55% off by going to babbel.com slash rumble. And by the way, Babbel is spelled B-A-B-B-E-L, Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash rumble. Rules and restrictions may apply. All right. Thank you, Babbel, uh, for supporting my podcast and, and my voice. I'm so grateful to those who spoke to us. If you want to go on my site, you can you can see video that we shot on there on Friday night at Grand Central. So grateful to Jewish Voice for Peace. Like I said, I I signed up and, and joined on Friday night. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Muslim. As you know, I'm a recovering Catholic. But all of our voices must be heard now. And we need to join with our Jewish brothers and sisters who are calling for this ceasefire and no more killing on either side a release of the hostages immediately violence war is not the answer 
I'm grateful for those who've taken the stand. I know for a, a lot of them, it's not easy. They've had their own trials and tribulations in the past few weeks with their friends, family members, others that are unhappy with their strong voices for peace. I'm sorry to hear that. We should all be that. We all have to do that. We all have to call our members of Congress and tell them that we do not want to be the bank for more death and destruction. We are not supporting this. I know it's hard for some people. I know I understand the pain. I don't know it because I haven't had to live it, but I know that I, I've seen enough of it in my lifetime and I'm sick of it all. So thank you all of our hundreds, thousands of Jewish brothers and sisters there at Grand Central the other night. And in a couple of days, I'll play part two of this uh, from the Palestinian-led march and um, rally that went across the, the borough of Brooklyn and across the Brooklyn Bridge, thousands there on Saturday and Saturday night. Very powerful moment, and I want you to hear the Palestinian voices of this. So we'll do that in a couple of days here on my podcast. Again, my great, great thanks to my two executive producers who've worked on this podcast, Basil from the very beginning, uh, Basil Hamden, and um, Angie Vargos, who is my current uh, editor and executive producer. Thank you for the great work you did and the, and the risks that you took to kind of pull this together. So let's close out with that song from Natalie Merchant, who is also a signer to the ceasefire uh, letter. It was the one song I felt just kind of conveyed where I'm at this week, these last couple weeks. Be well, everyone. This is Michael Moore. This is Rubble. We passed a school where children played Their lessons scarcely done We passed through fields of gazing grain We passed the setting sun We passed the setting